today as we gather in worship to rejoice and to give thanks at the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. As we make our beginning today, we do so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I share with you today from Psalm 62, picking up in verse 5. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. We trust in him at all times, O oh, his people, we pour out our hearts before him. God is a refuge for us, amen. Christ is made the sure foundation, Christ our head and cornerstone, chosen of the Lord and precious, binding all the church on one, holy Zion's hell. I invite you to join with me as we profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We confess our sins at this time before our God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all of our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We fail in taking care of your good creation instead exploiting it for selfish gain. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, you are forgiven in the wake of God's forgiveness. We are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your Spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and ordinances, that the Lord your God charge me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into to occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart, Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. That's our reading. O Word of God incarnate, O wisdom from on high, O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light of our dark sky, we praise you for the radiance that from the hallowed page, a lantern to our footsteps shines on from age to age. The church from you, dear Master, received the gift divine. 
And still that light is lifted o'er all the earth to shine. It is the chart and compass that all lies voyage through. Mid mist and rocks and quicksand still guides O Christ to you. Oh, make your church, dear Savior, a lamp of burnished gold to bear before the nations your true light as of old. Oh, teach your wandering pilgrims by this their path to trace Till clouds and darkness ended, they see you face to face. They see you face to face. So we are continuing through our sermon series uh, on Jesus's Sermon on the Mount, which we find in Matthew's Gospel. And so we've been moving through the last few weeks. Before we, we go into this week, let's go ahead and hear that gospel this morning. So it says in Matthew 5, beginning in verse 21, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it said that, it, or you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, or let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is our gospel reading. Let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, as we explore this text this morning, as we see, Lord, what you would have for your people in these words of Jesus, I pray Lord, that you equip me to proclaim your word faithfully. And Lord, for those that are watching this morning or this afternoon or this evening, whenever our church is gathered, Lord, that you will open our hearts to hear those words, Lord, see your great love in and through them. And Lord, help us put those words to action in our lives. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I am consistently fascinated, consistently fascinated by how well and how creative we can get at obeying the rules while still getting to do what we want. I mean, if there, is, if, there is, if there is anything more uniquely human, I'm not sure what it is, than being able to actually 
stick to what the, 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 the letter of the law is while doing exactly what we want anyway. And, and to that point, I've got a few examples of people doing exactly that. ABBA, the late 70s techno dance disco band was known for their wild outlandish outfits. But what you may not know is that those outlandish outfits were a result of a Swedish tax law, which stated that their costumes could not be written off as a business deduction unless it was wild enough that it could not be worn in public. So they were able to stick to the rules and still claim their clothes as a deduction. Pretty amazing. Or um, here, here's another one. In the United States, slippers that are imported or produced are taxed at a dramatically lower rate than other types of shoes. And so those Converse high tops that you see everywhere, if you've ever bought a pair, you'll notice that there's a thin layer of felt on the bottom, and that's on purpose because in order to have them taxed at 3% instead of up to 37%, those converse are covered with a layer of felt and are shipped out as slippers. Technically, they're following the rules. Here's one more. In the early 1900s, before we reached the heights of prohibition, there were a lot of really strict laws already in place on when and how you could drink beer in public. For example, in a lot of places, you could not serve beer to a customer unless it was served alongside food. And as a result, it became pretty popular to serve a sandwich along with a drink, but that sandwich wasn't eaten, it was taken back and then reserved over and over for people that ordered drinks, uh, eventually becoming so disgusting you couldn't eat it and that wasn't the point anyway, because the rules never said you had to eat the food that was served along with the drink. Our text this morning falls into the announcement of Jesus' public ministry. And Jesus, as always, is intentional about every step he takes. The first week we talked about the Beatitudes, which amazingly line up with the blessings that Moses speaks in Deuteronomy. And that's on purpose because Jesus is rooting his public ministry in Deuteronomy. God's people, God's people that are getting ready to go into the promised land land. And then he goes on to talk about how they are the salt and the light of the earth. We talked about last week and Pastor Richard did an amazing job with that. And in the last little bit of that text, at the last little bit of that text, Jesus goes on to say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, the new promised land. And then Jesus goes on to tell these hearers what it means to follow the rules as laid out in Deuteronomy as supposedly practiced by the Pharisees, the scribes, and God's people. And so he goes on to give a series of, you've heard it said, but then he goes on to say what that really means is this. So let's go through that. Jesus starts off, you, shan't, you shall not murder, right? Basic. And most of those hearers there, good Jewish folk, Good people trying to follow law say, well, I don't murder. That's a great thing. And Jesus says, you've heard it said don't murder. I'm telling you what that really means. The deeper meaning of that law is you shouldn't even hate your brother. You shouldn't insult your brother. In fact, if you've allowed that hate to get in there, you've already broken the commandments that God gave you at Mount Sinai, that Moses retold you before you entered the promised land. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm saying the real meaning of that commandment, the deeper meaning, the true way to fulfill that commandment is that you don't even lust after another woman or man. It's not enough to just not cheat, but you've broken the commandment long before you've ever actually entered into that relationship. He goes on to say, you shouldn't swear falsely. You've heard it said. I say to you, don't swear at all. Because even if you swear by something that's not God's holy name, 
You're going to swear by the earth. Well, God made the earth. I'm going to swear by the heavens. God sits in the heavens. Jesus is letting people know that just keeping the rules is not enough. He's laying out very clearly, he says that their righteousness needs to exceed that of those amazing rule followers, those Pharisees and scribes that are so focused on following the rules to the letter that they actually make sure that they are really and truly far from God. What the Pharisees and the scribes often let out is, or left out, is what we see in Deuteronomy when we get to what Jesus later talks about as the greatest commandment, that you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind. Jesus makes it really clear to those hearers to be in the kingdom of heaven, to be a part of God's people, means it's not enough to just keep the rules. In fact, you have to keep them perfectly. Jesus doesn't stutter. He makes it incredibly clear if your goal is to maintain a relationship with God the Father by keeping the rules, you have to do it perfectly. And here's the crazy thing. It still applies to us, too. When we read these, it's really easy for us to think sort of as... Our community members often think, which is, well, I'm a good person. I don't break the law. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't cheated on my spouse. I don't beat my kids, and I don't cheat on my taxes. And really, that's the point, right? I mean, that's our goal, is to be good enough, try our best, know that Jesus is going to fill the gaps, and off we go to heaven. That's not how it works. Jesus is very clear that if your goal is to get into heaven, by trying to be a good person. No amount of goodness that you're going to offer is going to be good enough. No amount. It actually reminds me of a TV show that I, I've watched with my wife a number of times. It's called The Good Place. If you've seen it, you know it's pretty funny. And if you haven't, the basic premise is this, that a group of people wake up in the afterlife, in the good place, heaven, only for it to turn out that it's all a big facade by the devil to actually torture them because they haven't earned enough good place points to go there. And as the season progresses, as the show progresses, they end up meeting a character in the real world who figured out the point system for the good place and goes about living a perfectly good life, making sure he can achieve enough points to get into the good place. So much so that there's even a scene in which he accidentally steps on a snail and the character is heartbroken and they have a funeral for the snail. He's figured out the system. If I can be good enough, I'll get there. Only for the show to progress and for you to find out that even that character has not earned enough points to get into the good place. Y'all, the same is true for us. There's no amount of goodness that you can bring to the table. No amount of points that you could earn to be able to redeem yourself. And that is exactly what Jesus is doing for the hearers in this text and the hearers this morning that are watching at whatever time. Jesus says, I know you cannot do enough. In fact, that is why I'm revealing to you now what it really means to keep the law because there's no amount of law keeping, no amount of rules that you can keep to be able to actually be good enough for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is addressing what is functionally a condition, not a behavior problem. Jesus, in laying bare the real meaning of these laws, to not commit adultery, to not murder, he is revealing what it actually means to try to be in the right relationship with God our Father, which is our hearts are screwed up. In fact, we can't even keep the most important commandment to love God with all our heart. We're affected, corrupted, stained by selfishness, by desires that are curved in on ourselves. We are absolutely unable to keep the law to keep the commandments good enough to get in. 
And Jesus says, I know. Jesus announces his public ministry by saying, you can't do enough to get in. But then Jesus goes on to say, however, I can. And then in this great mystery that unfolds over the rest of the Gospels, Jesus goes on to actually keep those commandments perfectly. To actually be that citizen in the kingdom of heaven, so much so that he's rejected, he's condemned wrongly, he's executed, all to take on what we cannot do, to take on the penalties, to take on our selfishness, to take on our sin, and then to die for it, to bury him in the grave. Why? So that on three days later, when he's raised from the dead, he can then give to us his new life. That he can, in and through our baptisms, invite us into a new kingdom, a new citizenship, and then transform our hearts with the power of the Holy Spirit. That we may start to share in that new heart, one that not only can keep the law, but desires to. Now, does that mean that we're going to do it all perfectly? Of course not. We're still flesh and bone. We haven't achieved perfection. Luther says we are both saints and sinners at the same time. But even so, Jesus says that's okay because through me, I give you my perfect keeping of the commandments. I give you my relationship with the Father. I bring you in and my resurrection into new life. My prayer for you as you hear this, my prayer for you is that you will be confronted by the fact that you can't do it good enough. You can't achieve it on your own. But that's not the point. Because my deeper prayer is that you will see in and through Jesus Christ that you don't have to. That he redeems you. That he comes for you. Just like those people, he comes so that you may have a new life, a new heart, a new nature. So that way you may be invited into a new kingdom, to a new way of living, knowing that you could never do it on your own. And that you would respond just by trusting in that goodness and in that promise. My prayer for you today is that this, this news strengthens you and keeps you, as we say so often, the Lord's Supper strengthens and keeps you in the true faith to life everlasting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your grace and your mercy you have given us new life through Jesus. That though we could never achieve it on our own, though we could not ever be good enough, and even in the trying, we push ourselves further away. But through Jesus, you give us new life. That in Jesus, you forgive our sins. That in Jesus, Lord, you rescue us from our condition that traps us and prevents us from loving you fully. Lord, I pray that you strengthen us with this message. I pray that you let this inhabit us, dwell in us, that we may go out and proclaim that good news to our friends and our families and our neighbors. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
guided by Christ, made known to the nations. Let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, for deacons and deaconesses, and for musicians and servers that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love. For skies and seas, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God raises up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth. For those who provide leadership in our cities and around the world, for nonprofit, non governmental organizations, for planning commissions and homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcast and all who await relief, that in the midst of suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them. For our congregation and community, for families big and small, and for the organizations that meet here during the week, that God's steadfast love serve as a model for relationships. We pray prayers of joy today, gracious God, with Mary Kay as she's returned home. We pray with Jack and rejoice at the relief from pain. We lift up Sherry and we Give thanks for the healing you've brought to her, and we pray for continuing healing. We pray also prayers of concern. We lift up Bill Mink, and we ask for your presence with him and your healing hand. We pray for Joe, that you would strengthen him in his suffering. And we lift up John as he heals from a broken leg and from COVID, and also Laura, who recovers from COVID. We lift up prayers of comfort to you this day, Lord. We in particular pray for the Kohler family as they mourn the loss of Pastor Fred Kohler. We pray for all of his family, but in particular, we lift up his wife, Gloria. Strengthen them all with the knowledge of the good news that you have called your faithful servant to be with you. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith, whose lives serve as example of gospel living. They point us to salvation through Christ. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. the 
theme I will sing, I will sing While millions join the theme I will sing And when I am Who is the great I am While millions join the theme I will sing While millions join the theme I will sing Go today with the blessing of God. May God bless you and keep you. May God be present in your feasting and sustain you in your fasting. May God use your feasting and fasting to bless the world and to give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.